Welcome back to another episode of Messing Around with Math. Yes, this is a math video, not a civil engineering one. All roads will be infinitely thin, and all cars will drive at a constant speed, through 12-way intersections without stopping. You didn't really think a video on this channel would be useful, did you? Alright, let's start. Some background first, in case you're from a place that doesn't have city blocks. The road layout of cities sometimes looks like this, a square grid, and the big question we're trying to answer is, would a hexagonal grid be more efficient for transportation? To answer this question objectively, we need some sort of way to measure the efficiency of each grid. How good is it at transporting people around? There are, of course, many ways to measure efficiency, but for now let's use this. We take the grid, we pick a starting location in a set amount of time. Given this starting location and time limit, there will be a reachable area. Any location inside this area you can drive to within the time limit, but any place outside of this area will be unreachable within the time limit. So the bigger the reachable area, the better, and the most efficient grid would have the biggest reachable area. Alright, now let's just compare the two grids. The reachable area for a square grid looks like this. How do we know? We just start at the starting point and move outwards step by step. So this is the reachable area after 1 minute, and this is the reachable area after 2 minutes. I should mention, throughout this video, all cars will travel at 1 block per minute. Anyway, as you increase the time limit, you can see that the reachable area becomes a square. How big is the square? Well, if the time limit is t minutes, then you have time to move t blocks. You can move t blocks east or t blocks north. You can move t blocks in any of the four cardinal directions. However, you can't move t blocks northeast because there's no northeast road. You need to go along the roads and this slows you down if you're going northeast. Anyway, you can calculate the area of the square to be 2t squared. For the hexagonal grid, we just do the same thing. In this case, the reachable area ends up becoming a hexagon with an area of about 1.95t squared. The square grid's reachable area is slightly bigger, because notice how in the hexagonal grid you can't move in a straight line. Any path you take will always be slightly inefficient. Hexagonal grids do have one thing going for them though. Notice how square grids are very efficient in these four directions, but very inefficient in these other four directions, while hexagonal grids are a little inefficient in every direction. Anyway, square grids win. They are slightly better in terms of reachable area. Now this has nothing to do with real life because this is not a great way to measure efficiency. For instance, triangular grids have an even bigger reachable area, but that's only because there are more roads in a triangular grid than there are in a square or hexagonal grid. In fact, if you add a bunch of roads to the hexagonal grid, all of a sudden it's the most efficient. Wow, wonder what happened there. It's almost like more roads means more ways to travel around, leading to a bigger reachable area. In fact, why don't we make the entire surface a huge road? Why have buildings when you can have the most efficient transportation system possible? The reachable area becomes a perfect circle, bigger than the reachable area of any other grid. We have now achieved 100% efficiency. The reachable area of all the other grids is only a fraction of this circle's area. Okay, sarcasm aside, this is a pretty bad way to measure efficiency, because you can just cheat by adding a bunch of roads. So let's add some sort of penalty for having too many roads. How are we going to do that? Well, why don't we have this many roads in real life? Because that would be too expensive. This is the main reason, there's no point having this many roads when this many is good enough. So we should add some sort of penalty to the efficiency that scales with the length of road we have. But just think about how that would work for a second. How many roads are in a grid? They all have the same amount, countably infinite. But in real life, this grid would clearly be more expensive than this grid because cities are not infinitely large. So how about we specify a region and count the length of road in there? Now the length of road in each grid is different, so we just give this one a bigger penalty. But a new problem arises. Look at this. This new grid is just the old one, but more spaced out. And since it has less roads, its penalty will be smaller, the efficiency will have gone up. But we still have the same reachable area as before, because, well, it's a square grid. The reachable area is still the same shape as it used to be. Funnily enough, we now have the opposite problem as before. Instead of having a loophole where we add a bunch of roads to improve efficiency, we now have a loophole where we remove a bunch of roads to improve efficiency. So the lesson here is, we shouldn't have a penalty for having too many roads. It doesn't work because it incentivizes removing all the roads, which is in general a bad idea, you know? I don't think a city with two roads would work very well. So we need to come up with another penalty. What could possibly work? We need a penalty for grids with too many roads, but it should stay penalizing when you space the roads out. In other words, it should be based on the inherent structure of the grid, instead of how dense the roads are. One possible solution is to count the number of roads at each intersection. Square grids have four-way intersections, and this doesn't change even if you space the roads out. But when you try adding more roads in a way that increases the reachable area, the number of roads at each intersection suddenly spikes to 8, which we can penalize. So both loopholes have now been patched. 
What's even better is that this penalty makes sense in real life. Eight-way intersections would be very inefficient. Because there are so many cars that need to go through the intersection, it would be a while until it was your turn. So if you were traveling through this grid, you would probably spend the majority of your trip staring at a red light. In fact, we don't even need to add a penalty, because waiting a long time at an intersection inherently reduces the reachable area. One hour of driving through four-way intersections will take you much farther than one hour of driving through eight-way intersections, so a grid with four-way intersections will have a larger reachable area than a grid with eight-way intersections. So here's the plan. Instead of our driver going through each intersection instantly, we will make them wait at each intersection, and the amount of time they spend waiting will increase if there are a lot of roads at that intersection. Let's just say that intersections with X roads will have an X minute wait. So square grids will have a 4 minute wait, and hexagonal grids will have a 3 minute wait. Well, if you do the calculations, hexagonal grids end up winning over square grids. Previously, the two reachable areas were pretty similar in size, square grids were a little bit more efficient. But since hexagonal grids only have 3 way intersections instead of 4, they win pretty decisively. We do have one more contender though. If you remove some sections of road from square grids, you get a brick pattern with 3 way intersections not 4. Its reachable area is almost as good as a square grid's, it looks like this. Basically the square grid reachable area, but with these two parts cut off. The reason these two parts are cut off is because in a square grid, moving up or down is pretty straightforward, so you can actually reach these two parts before the time limit. But in the brick grid, moving up or down is a lot more of a hassle because for every up, you have to go right or left in order to go up again. So your going up speed is only half of what it is in the square grid, hence why these two sections are not reachable for the brick grid. So does this modified square grid end up winning against the hexagonal one? No. It is slightly better than the unmodified square grid though. So maybe we can modify the square grid in a different way that allows it to surpass the hexagonal grid. Unfortunately, I don't think that's possible. At least I haven't been able to find something. I suspect that there's no way to modify the square grid to make it better than the hexagonal one, but I haven't been able to prove this, so this is a puzzle for you guys. So for now, it looks like the hexagonal grid is the most efficient according to our latest definition of efficiency. Now, of course, don't take this seriously. This still has nothing to do with real life. If you were a civil engineer or something and you were actually trying to find which grid was the best, you would probably attach some sort of penalty for having confusing navigation, and also a penalty for having hexagonal buildings and 20 other different variables as well. Or at least I think that's how they would do it, I'm not a civil engineer. Which is probably a good thing now that I think of it. My point is, we're just messing around here. And we're not even messing around accurately. Since this script was written, I've already discovered two problems with the video thus far. First of all, remember that loophole earlier where we could remove a bunch of roads and end up with a higher efficiency? It turns out that we can still do that. This loophole was never actually patched. Look at this square grid. You drive for one minute and stop for four minutes, since it's a four-way intersection. And then you repeat the cycle again, so you spend 20% of your time driving overall. Spacing out the grid. Now the cycle is, you drive for two minutes and stop for four minutes and then you repeat that again. So now you spend 33% of your time driving, which is more than before. And since you spend more of your time driving, you can go farther, so the reachable area is bigger, the efficiency is higher. We never fixed the loophole, it's still here. What we should have done was keep the old system where cars didn't have to wait at intersections, and just slap a penalty on top. Six-way intersections? 6% 6 penalty to the efficiency. Using this new system, 11-way intersections are optimal. How do I know that? Notice how six-way intersections result in a hexagon as the reachable area, and eight-way intersections result in an octagon as the reachable area. Also notice how the radius of these polygons remains constant. This pattern actually continues and you can use some trigonometry in order to solve for the reachable area. And then I just tested a bunch of values, and it turns out 11-way intersections are optimal with 83.65% efficiency. Don't even ask me what an 11-way intersection grid would look like. Anyway, that's the first problem with this video, here's the second one. Look at this grid. At this intersection, we would wait 8 minutes because it's an 8-way intersection, but at this other intersection, we would only wait 4 minutes. So if you want to travel between this location and this location, is the fastest path really a straight line like we assumed it to be? Maybe you can go faster by doing some wacky stuff that we would never think of. It doesn't work on this grid, but my point is, it might work on another grid. And of course, if you have a faster way to travel, it affects the reachable area. So now all our data is inaccurate. And one more problem just to top it all off. When I said cars would wait 4 minutes at a 4-way intersection, you probably thought to yourself, wow, that's kind of randomly specific. Maybe there's a deep underlying reason for why he chose to do it this way, and he'll explain this deep underlying reason later on in the video. There's no deep underlying reason! I just used whatever felt right. Same for the, oh, there's a 6% penalty for 6-way intersections. Again, I pulled that rule out of my ass. No reasoning at all. Why isn't it square root 6% penalty? 
That's just as valid, and we would end up with a completely different answer. Instead of 11-way intersections being the most efficient, it would now be 23-way intersections. Hey, you know what? Let's stop and reconsider our life choices. It's been 10 minutes already, and we still haven't figured anything out. Maybe the problem has been reachable areas. This whole time, our definition of efficiency has been, how large is the reachable area? Maybe that's why we're having so many problems. So let's start at the very beginning and find another definition of efficiency. The point of all these road grids is to get places preferably quickly. So we could define efficiency based on how quickly you can travel between two points. If we have a square grid and we want to get from point A to point B, the shortest possible route is pretty easy to find. In this case, it's 7. We'll call this the grid distance. So, the grid distance between these two points is 7, but the normal distance, or Euclidean distance, is just 5 by the Pythagorean theorem. So think cars for grid distance, the journey is 7 blocks by car, and birds for Euclidean distance, the journey is 5 blocks by bird. Okay, so what is the point of all this? Well, we're trying to find some way to measure efficiency, right? The faster you can travel between point A and point B, the more efficient this grid is. For the square grid, the travel time is 7 minutes. Maybe for another type of grid, the travel time is only 6 minutes. In that case, we would consider that grid more efficient. But no matter what grid you have, the travel time will never be below 5 minutes. 5 minutes would be maximum 100% efficiency because you're never going to outrun the bird. The shortest path between two points is a straight line 5 blocks long, and it's impossible to get below 5 blocks. So here's our new definition of efficiency, one that doesn't involve reachable area. We divide the Euclidean distance by the grid distance. So for the square grid, the efficiency would be 5 over 7, 71%. For the slightly better grid where the travel time was 6 minutes, the efficiency would be 5 over 6, 83%. And for the maximum efficiency grid where there was a road directly connecting points A and B, the efficiency would be 5 over 5, 100%. Perfect, perfect, this matches up with what we want. The faster the travel time, the higher the efficiency. One more thing. We can't just measure efficiency off of these two points, because of course, there are other places in the city that we also need to get to. So what we'll do is pick another two points and run the same calculation again, Euclidean distance over grid distance. And we just keep doing this, and we average out everything at the end to get our final efficiency score. By the way, this method does have a loophole. Just like with reachable areas, you can add in a bunch of roads to increase the efficiency. So let's just ignore every other grid besides square and hexagonal, and only compare these two. Once again, I'm going to spare you the calculations. I tend to skim over calculations on this channel because I don't find them as interesting, but you're free to try them out yourself, of course. And let me know if I made a mistake. Also, here's a small footnote about how exactly I picked two random points, because it turns out there's more nuance to that than you might expect. Anyway, here are the final results of this video. If we measure efficiency using reachable area, square grids have efficiency 63.7%, and hexagonal grids have efficiency 62%. Then we went on a side tangent where we tried waiting at each intersection, and that didn't really work out, too many inconsistencies, but hexagonal grids did end up winning. Our next efficiency metric was having a direct penalty based on the number of roads at each intersection. Again, this has a lot of problems with it, but we get 59.7% for square grids and 59% for hexagonal grids. And here we have our newest efficiency measure, Euclidean distance divided by grid distance. If we use this metric, square grids have efficiency 79.4%, and hexagonal grids have efficiency 78.7%. Truly devastating for CGP Grey. Alright, I'm done talking about this topic. That's it for this video, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next Sunday. Peace.